So um, we're calling this Caregiving 101. Um, you've, uh, we both have had some experience at that. So we've figured we'd, we'd share that. We're certainly not experts by any means, uh, but you kind of rallied to the cause on what you have to do. And I think that's kind of where we came from. So um, hopefully we'll share something that will be meaningful to you. And uh, again, we emphasize we're certainly not experts at this by any means. And um, I kind of appreciate having all good friends on, yeah. <laughs> on this because uh, all of you will understand that uh, <laughs> if you run into me and Pat, please don't mention this. Uh, he thinks I'm going to another meeting. Uh, I just think this could be really sensitive to him. Right. Sure. And uh, as I say, they, they got us into this, but uh, I don't want it to backfire on me, I guess is what it amounts to. So really appreciate it kind of keeping it quiet. It's kind of a difficult situation when you are dealing as a caregiver of keeping the loved one, um, keeping up their high esteem, health, self, self esteem and just feeling of worth. So mm -hmm. that was the main reason that I decided to uh, lie my way through this. <laughs> so, <laughs> here we are. so, okay. And um, I think a lot of you probably know I got into this. Um, I decided it was time for me to retire from the college to take care of my husband. Um, I could tell that it was the time for me to retire, although it's not what I wanted to do, but um, there was no question about it. And you know what? I would do it again. Um, it was just one of those interesting things that um, life hands you, that you get to have an opportunity to learn a lot of new things, a lot of new things. I don't yeah. know. That's yeah. We're gonna yeah, go. and most of you know my story too. Uh, and Pat was diagnosed with multiple myeloma cancer and Parkinson's in 05. Uh, so semi-caregiving started fairly early when, uh, because in 05, when he was being treated, I went there, I was with him all the time, lots of doctor's appointments, things like that. Well, he was self-sufficient for a period of time very differently, but just as Lindy was saying, in 16, it just kind of became apparent that uh, I needed to be home more. So I did exactly what she did. Then what really took us into caregiving was in uh, 2019, when he had a stroke. And so that really changed the whole scope of things. So it was a good thing that I wasn't trying to work at the same time, very mm -hmm. definitely. So uh, he's, he's doing good. He, he loves people and uh, we, we're in the driveway a lot. So if you wanna come by, <laughs> <laughs> driveway right. drinking has become a priority for us. So. Uh, so that's why we decided that maybe we could do this, even though we really don't know what we were doing. <laughs> and the interesting thing is that Jim also had a cancer. And so as we were dealing with his Parkinson's, which he actually had for 14 years before I retired, um, he, we went through chemo, like Joan and Pat have gone through chemo. Um, we, I know a lot of specifically Parkinson's patients that also tend to have a cancer of some type, which sort of complicates um, doctor's appointments and caregiving and all types of things. It was really interesting. Um, fortunately, Joan and I have gone down a very similar path with the difference being her husband, Pat, is extremely social and to this day, extremely social all the time. Whereas Jim was an accountant and was extremely quiet. And as his disease progressed, he became more quiet. Um, so we had two different paths really on this. Um, you wanna, let's see, where are yep, we? Oh, we okay. Go. There we go. So, <laughs> yeah. All right, so one thing that gets thrown at you right away um, at whatever stage you enter caregiving, is certainly lots of roles. Um, you're trying to be a good caregiver. Uh, we've already talked about the fact that we felt like we really had to leave our careers behind. Mm -hmm. uh, social life, 
it's different, very definitely. Uh, COVID's done its share of making things different that way too. Finances, you find yourself taking care of a lot of things that you probably depended on your loved one mm -hmm. to take care of. And we're using the term loved one because obviously this could be a spouse, it could be a child, it could be a mother, a father, anybody uh, can find themselves in, in the role as far as a caregiver goes. Uh, but the roles change uh, sometimes very rapidly, sometimes more progressively. But uh, the loved one gets frustrated because they can't do what they used to be able to do. And you probably get frustrated because you're doing a lot more than you're used to doing. And uh, <laughs> I'm learning how to fix things that I didn't know how to <laughs> fix before. So things kind oh, of yeah. uh, role changes definitely <laughs> are a big part of it. Yes, definitely. Um, so um, you need to have conversations, early conversations about this. Um, I think I would say both of our husbands were in somewhat of denial that they were sick, although we were very aware that they were sick. Um, and so you talk about who's going to take on the responsibilities in the home. Um, and as Joan said, all of a sudden, um, my husband being an accountant and had taken care of finances all of my married life, which was 50 years, all of a sudden, um, his writing was so small, which is why he actually retired, he could no longer even write his name. And so that really changes things in the home where um, I had been very used to him doing all of that and uh, couldn't any longer just depend on him to do it. So I had a big, I wouldn't say a big learning curve. I was very aware of financial and that type of thing in the home. I just never did any of it um, because I didn't have to. And that might lead you to needing to have some professional help on this, which would be, oh, uh, no, nope, I hit the wrong button. Okay. <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm a novice at this. Right. Okay. So, <clears throat> Lindy's going to go over some of the legal forms. Again, we're certainly not professionals, but we put together a list of things that we mutually agreed would really be <clears throat> wise to get in place early, early. rather right. than late. So obviously a living will, hospitals will ask you when you go to the hospital, do you have a living will? Um, trust, we all know, and I would assume that most of you have a trust because it prevents you from going to probate when something does happen. Last will and testament, I would think all of you have those in place. Durable power of attorney is where all of a sudden I was responsible for doing things that maybe I hadn't in the past and that sort of protected me um, to do things that durable power of attorney, both just legally and the health care durable power of attorney. They would ask for that um, when we would go to the hospital. And, Jim and I made many, many visits to the hospital during his last four years. Um, let's see, the next, there we go. Um, an advanced directive, obviously, the hospital wants that. Your HIPAA authorization. I found out on that one, um, when we were in the hospital, oftentimes they wouldn't, they weren't forthright with the information I needed. But once I would say, no, you have my HIPAA authorization on file and you need to, I need to talk with the doctor. I need to talk to the nurses. I need to know what happened last night. If I hadn't stayed in the hospital, which is very rare, um, a do not resuscitate had to be on file. And interesting, I took it with me every single time and I would think that they would have it on file, but they didn't. I, had, I would have to bring a new one every single time. And then um, a hard discussion that you need to have with the loved one very early in the disease process. And it's what the loved one's end of life desires are. Um, you might not think about that, but um, just recently, my daughter's father-in-law actually went to the hospital. He had a cancer, went to the hospital, had pneumonia um, and had no idea that he would pass away in the hospital, but he did. And unfortunately, her mother-in-law had never had this discussion as to what is your desire for the end of life? Um, and it, that's a hard discussion to have 
You may have to have that with, um, some of you may have to have it with your children um, so that they know and have papers in place and so that um, really whatever your desires are. In my case, Jim wanted his body donated to KU for Parkinson's research. And I had to have all of that in place, which I did. Um, and he and I had had several discussions about that. I'm not sure had I not known his desire, if I would ever have done that, to be quite honest with you. I, I don't know if I really would have thought about that. And we got that actually from the same Parkinson's doctor, Joan and I have been to many times. Um, they, his um, PA brought it up one day um, to us, to Jim and I. And when we left that doctor's appointment, there was no question in his mind that that's what he wanted to have. So the sad thing on that, it takes, if you do say go into a willed body program, it took me almost a year and a half to get his ashes. And so it, it, in a way, it, um, it, 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 I, it was just a long time before I felt complete closure with my husband. Um, but I'd do it again, you know, do it again. Let's see, now, I think that's it. Um, one thing that I'm running against right now is uh, Pat has a credit card <laughs> that definitely needs to be canceled. Well, if you don't have the uh, power of attorney, mm -hmm. they won't even talk to you. And it's also not the easiest thing to do. This particular one happens to be with Citibank. And so I was supposed to mail in like the six pages of power of attorney to get this done. So one of the things my son's supposed to be accomplishing while I'm here is getting that dang credit card canceled. So, uh, but it's amazing where the, those forms just become really necessary. And that was another thing, bank accounts and safe deposit boxes. Um, I ended up putting my son on them with me and Jim, but not knowing exactly what might happen. Um, and we talk about this a little bit later, but if something would have happened to me, I needed to have somebody to be able to get into the bank accounts and the safe deposit box, because that's where a lot of my paperwork was. Um, and without having my son on those, then it would have been just Jim and I, and if I was in the hospital, then Jim was incapable of doing any of it, then nobody had access to the checking accounts or the safe deposit box, which I know sounds strange, but those are just the little kind of things that you have to think about, you know? Is there somebody that can get into your bank account? Not that they will, you know, take your money away, but if you're in the hospital, um, you may not be capable of writing a check or getting the money. So let's see. Okay. Uh. <laughs> All right. Care for a loved one. We're constantly reminded, or at least I certainly are, because Pat's been in so much therapy is that you want them to become as independent as possible. <laughs> well, he's pretty, he's pretty good with a caregiver, but he's not very good with me by any means. <laughs> and um, sometimes that independence will backfire on you. Uh, the other day, uh, an, uh, a very meaningful neighbor brought over a chocolate fudge cake. And I mean, big <laughs> chocolate fudge cake. So he had already had some, well, I don't know whether he was trying to sneak a piece or just wanted to do it himself, but he dropped it. So, you know, if I had been there, we wouldn't have had that mess. But <laughs> so uh, I don't, it, it's a tough balance because there's times when they don't want you hovering mm -hmm. over them yeah. And then there's other times that you kind of wish you had been there. So, but uh, they definitely encourage you to make, make them as independent as possible. And if you can pick out this cartoon, <laughs> let me tell you, you can find cartoons about anything. <laughs> you can't use them all because some of them are copy written, but this was one I found, and it says, uh, if you can't make it out, she has a tuba around her neck, 
And it says, it gets my caregiver's attention better than a bell. And <laughs> it is important that you can hear them. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a bit of difficulty because our bedroom's on second floor and where Pat tends to spend a whole lot of time is on first floor. So I, I eliminate all background noise and things like that because it is pretty important that you can hear them, but uh, hopefully not a tuba. <laughs> Yeah, each loved one is going to have very different needs, and they're going to vary. And the needs will change progressively as the whatever disease we're, you're dealing with. Um, nutritional needs, you know, you want them to eat healthy, you want them to have a good diet, um, but different little kinds of things, depending on what the illness is, um, they may not be hungry. They may not want to have insurer. They may not. They may just want chocolate pie all the time. Um, and you know, you try to keep them as healthy as you can. But um, eating becomes an issue. It became a big issue with Jim with his Parkinson's to the point that I finally ended up having to feed him. And I changed my cooking um, a lot. I changed cooking a lot, specifically earlier instead of giving him spaghetti noodles, I changed it to a piece of pasta that could be picked up with a fork, one individual piece. Um, just minor changes you make to your cooking purposely. And I think um, as far as seasoning and flavoring is concerned, you have a tendency to over season flavor on the food. Um, you want it to be healthy, but you finally say, you know what, I'll fix, I'll do anything. And it just so happened and I know this sounds horrible. One of Jim's favorite things was Kentucky Fried Chicken. So once a week, I went to Kentucky Fried Chicken and got his favorite food for him. And um, I personally don't feel it's real nutritious <laughs> or something that you should be eating once a week. But you know what? I wanted him to have whatever it was he wanted. So he had Kentucky Fried Chicken. And surprisingly enough, it's one of Pat's favorite foods. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, general hygiene. Uh, that one, we could probably just do a yeah. seminar on general hy hygiene alone. Um, you know, uh, bathing. Um, uh, one of the things I always like to say, it gets really difficult and you have to try to really keep them as their hygiene up as much as you can. I couldn't cut Jim's toenails. I got to the point that I couldn't do it. And so he fought me and fought me and fought me. Finally, I said, you know what? One day we woke up, I said, you're getting a pedicure. And he said, oh, no, men don't get pedicures. And I said, oh, well, we're going to get a pedicure. And surprisingly enough, we went and he fell in love with them. And they took care of his toenails and we did a lot of pedicures. Um, he thought it was wonderful. Um, difficult getting him there and back, but it was an answer that I, I just thought, and there will be some other general hygiene answers you'll have to think about. Bars in your showers, shower chairs. I mean, a lot of different equipment as far as hygiene is concerned that you'll be working with. Um, depends. <laughs> lots of depends. Lots and of actually depends. that's not the best brand if you need to know yeah. a brand like that. <laughs> right. But. Jones found a better brand. Um, so uh, supportive care family, friends, and paid help. You know, there's no question about it. I was in a very fortunate position. All three of my children lived within 10 minutes of me. And so I had a huge family support. And friends, um, Jim being of the type of personality he was, tended to shy away from many friend activities. Um, I don't know whether it was an embarrassment to him. I don't know. He just he didn't feel comfortable being sick around a lot of people. And so it really changed our social life a lot. Whereas Pat is the opposite. He would be happy 24 seven a day to have social life going on, you know? So, um, and then the paid help, what I, I, I used two different agencies to come in because I had to have some time away. And so I used two agencies on, if you're going to get agencies, I recommend that you Talk to other people who have used agencies to find out who they have used, were they happy with them, what are the variables involved. 
I used one that only had an, they were more expensive, but they only had an hour minimum. The other one I used most often had a four hour minimum, but I found at the end of three hours, uh, I didn't need them there any longer. And so I often went home early instead of the four, I paid for the four hours, but I, at the end of the three hours, I was going home. So you wanna check into it and there's no reason not to use more than one, depending on what you need. There are times I only needed the one hour. Um, and so I paid more money to have that one hour. Um, but talk to other people about, there's a tremendous amount of services that provide paid help. And I was very fortunate. All of the people that I brought into the home were wonderful. They, they were wonderful. We didn't have any problems. Um, I don't know, Joan. We, we've been probably 85% pleased. And uh, I've had somebody come in ever since he came home after the stroke because um, basically uh, I didn't feel confident in leaving him alone at all anymore. And uh, if I was gonna keep my sanity, I had to do that. So, uh, <laughs> and one thing about the agency, I did investigate some private, totally private. I did end up staying with, uh, I'm still with the agency at this point. And the main reason is because uh, they are bonded. They do get mm -hmm. checked. Uh, they have to, you know, pass yeah. the test, things like that. And then there's, it was only one, but, uh, you know, I've had to fire people before, but it's a lot easier to call the agency and say, send me somebody new. Mm -hmm. So that was just one kind of burden that I kind of felt was worth it. And uh, the biggie thing, no matter who it is, is going to be home safety. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Wendy and I've certainly talked a lot about those type of things, and it varies. We were faced with the fact, uh, well, and I think it comes up, it comes up later. Yeah. Um, Coming, coming up later. Okay, healthcare, doctors, meds, rehab, hospital. Uh, I've been fortunate, Pat's only been in the hospital once. Uh, Lindy's got way too much experience at that. <laughs> the, but it, you need them, uh, very definitely. And um, you have to learn to work with them. If rehab is offered to your loved one, sign Take up. It. <laughs> it has been absolutely a godsend for Pat. Um, they're, they're good people. They work him hard. They're social with him. It's just been amazing. Mm -hmm. um, we also kind of put together a list of just hard decisions. And probably one that she and I both fought with is, can they drive? Uh, mm -hmm. let, uh, Lindy blames a cop. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, Jen, blame, blame other people when you blame can. somebody else when you're taking that driver's license away. Um, Jim had a car accident. Well, he had three car accidents in one year. Um, fortunately, all he ever hurt was the car. That's it. But the third one was a really bad accident, just an odd circumstance. He was driving home from rehab, actually. And um, the police followed him and called me. Um, and we got the car taken away to where we had our cars taken care of. And from that point on, I told him, well, the policeman said, you can't drive anymore. So I never took the blame for it. And I never went and brought that car home. Wherever, when I took it to the Acura dealer, they asked me, are you in, interested in selling this car? And I said, yes. And I never brought it home again. So that car was gone, but it's a very, very hard thing because he should not have been driving when he was. I can guarantee you that. And you think about liability, um, that's a horrible thing. Um, and it's a really hard discussion. Credit cards, finances. Yeah, we've uh, kind of already covered that type yeah. of stuff. But yeah, they are, they're definitely hard decisions. And, and uh, Pat still wants to know when he can drive again. So oh. but we, we blame the doc. So thank heavens they <laughs> entered in. Uh, most people will probably also deal with lots of changes. Um, every loved one's gonna be different. So we're just putting together a list of things that one we've either read about or definitely experienced. Uh, cognitive is a really, is a toughie, uh, particularly when they still think they know what they're talking about. And uh, 
I, I worry he gives advice to people and if they take it seriously, I'm really concerned. But, um, but cognitive is definitely an issue. Memory loss, that one's causing us problems right now because it's, I'm not involved. I didn't know anything about this. Well, he was involved. He knew something about it, but he's forgotten. Um, we, Lindy kind of hinted on the advanced personality changes. We have found that the personality that they had becomes even more heightened. Mm -hmm. So Jim became more recluse. Pat wants people over all the time. Um, we can level of physical exercise or activity uh, will, you know, some people will go through it really well and some people won't. So there's definitely going to be change. Right. And, and one of my real blessings in the last four years of Jim's life, he was extremely um, comfortable watching golf on TV, like 24 seven. I watched more sports and TV than I even cared to tell you. But because he didn't want to socialize, that truly was his outlet. And he was very, um, uh, he, he didn't complain. We had enhanced personality changes in the opposite direction of Joan. He became very quiet and very content. And I contributed to being one of my big blessings. He was extremely content, never argumentative, never angry. Um, as long as he had sports on TV. We were okay. <laughs> All right. Another thing that definitely comes into play are financial possibilities. Um, and this list could be a lot longer, but uh, <laughs> modifications to the home. Uh, I modified, Lindy moved. Mm -hmm. Hygiene products we've already mentioned. Meds very definitely. Uh, it's like every year you've got to check part D to find out what your meds have done. Right. Outside help, we've already mentioned. Medical equipment, uh, we mentioned bars. We ended up putting in a uh, chairlift to get him to uh, second floor. Uh, just the little things, as we've already kidded about, depends, checks, just <laughs> hygiene issues. Um, Lindy keeps track of everything. So I think I remember you saying one day it was $45 a month for, yeah. for the pound. So. <laughs> Right. Um, and ours is worse than that, but that's okay. Uh, other financial things, obviously, if we end up in the hospital, depending on what type of insurance you have, Pat had to go into respite care, which uh, I did have, uh, do have a long care term policy on him, but they don't click in for 90 days. And so that was totally out of pocket. Assisted living, um, as I say, I've got, if we get to 90 days, I've got a little bit of coverage for him there and long-term care. And uh, I put in transportation, not because it affects us because we live in a metropolitan area and not that far away, but having been in the cancer center and mm -hmm. for people getting transfusions and things and hearing the stories of people having to come in the night before, spend the night so that their loved one can get the transfusion and then they have to drive home. So I guess if you're going to be sick, you want to be in a nice metropolitan yeah. area that has all the services for sure, because it certainly can be a biggie. And I would just say on long-term care, be very cautious of it. It's, ex it's a expensive insurance. There's no question about it. Um, by the time I thought maybe I wanted to look into it, it was too late in our case. I couldn't get it because Jim had had Parkinson's for so long. But it's very expensive. And like Joan says, it doesn't kick in right away. And when it does kick in, maybe it's $100 a day um, that you'd be receiving. But for the most part, it will not. I, I think people have the idea of long term care, it will take care of all the expense. And that is not the truth by any means. Yeah. And it definitely varies by policy, which we can't well, get into. <laughs> right. Right. And then the other thing you want to, the secondary insurance. Oh, okay. You want to um, check in. There's a lot of secondary insurance out there. Um, my, my hospital bills in the last um, four years with three treatments of chemo and probably, I don't know, in four years, we had at least 20 hospitalizations, at least, if not more. Um, 
my total out of pocket on my secondary insurance, I think I totaled under $500. Oh. And wow. my expenses were well into the millions. So, no, but no question about secondary, it. you're talking about your supplement? My supplemental your supplement, yes, yeah. Mary Beth. And which, which kind did you have? Um, he had Cigna. Cigna, yeah. Which cost me, it was around 250 a month. Mm -hmm. I have a different kind, but he had Cigna. And I'm telling you, um, truthfully, my the expenses for those four years were well into the millions. So well, it was def it was the expenses could have been well into the millions yeah. for his last four years, but the insurance was unbelievable. So be very sure to look at your secondary insurance very carefully. Yeah, uh, it was part F. And now most of it's gone into part G. Mm -hmm. I've got Pat on Blue Cross Blue Shield just because it's been incredible. Uh, when he was doing chemo, you get these papers all the time. And the retail cost of a treatment oh. was $32,000. And so, you know, <laughs> you'd be wiped out in no time with something yeah. like that. And uh, so, yeah, you, I don't know, the insurance... I, we don't, none of us like it, but I sure wouldn't want to be without it. Right. Yeah. All right. Another one of the cartoons. <laughs> that pill is for your heart. That one for your eyes. That one for blood pressure. That's for diabetes. <laughs> That's a blood thinner. That's cholesterol. That's for dizziness. And then he wants to know what's for dessert. <laughs> um, I highly encourage if your loved ones, uh, Medicine and doctors gets extensive. You've got to have cheat sheets. There's no way I can keep up with all of this. Um, every time the, the drug manufacturer gets a new manufacturer, they change the color, they change the shape. Um, and so he's dealing with 31 pills a day. I'm just divvying those out. It's one of my grittiest moments is putting those things together. And uh, that's is. His is rather complex. So he has seven doctors and trying to keep track of all the doctors. Mm -hmm. So cheat sheets and you carry them everywhere because everybody wants you to fill out the form again. Mm -hmm. uh, I surely wish Hillary would have gotten that chip for us, but uh, until, <laughs> until we can all carry around our medical information, you might as well do what Lenny suggested. You carry it around, you, you, you just carry it all around. You carry it around with you. The other thing on, on medicines, I would say um, that I, I had the experience where they were like, at one point, one of the gym's doctors wanted to give him a pill to help his memory. And it was like, you know what, well, we're just not gonna do that. I, I'm just not going to give him another pill when in fact um, his memory was slipping. You know, and what would be truthfully, what kind of effect would I really have at that point that his memory would have gotten any better? It wouldn't. The doctor said it just would have um, kept him where he was, which I'm not sure that would be the case. You know, I'm not sure that would have happened. But um, yeah, and those are some of the tough, tough decisions the caregiver starts mm -hmm. having to make too, because. Uh, We've got lots of pills from memory, actually. But uh, uh, he was put on one anti-hallucination drug. Oh. Oh. Yeah. And that made the symptoms so much worse right. in just two days. Mm -hmm. So here you've bought this expensive drug. And as a caregiver, you go, uh-uh, this mm -hmm. isn't working. Right. So you just take him off of yeah. it. And we had another one that just, you know, and you can't blame anybody. They're trying to help you out. But man, every human obviously reacts differently mm -hmm. to it. And so it's sometimes so much trial and error that uh, it's confusing for sure. Right. And then the other thing with medicine, the Parkinson's medicine is a timed medicine. It has to be given in a certain amount of time every day. And when we were in the hospital, one of the bigger problems I had, we usually ended up in the hospital around five or six o'clock at night. Well, he needed to have his medicine. And in the emergency room, they wouldn't give it to him. So I finally started taking it to the hospital with me, all of his medicines. 
And I would go out to the desk and I'd say, are you ready to give him his Parkinson's medicine? And 10 times out of 10, no. I'd say, great, I'm giving it to him. And I would, I would administer his Parkinson's medicine in the emergency room, even though you're not supposed to do that. And I didn't care. I mean, I just gave it to him. <laughs> They're going to put you in the hospital. <laughs> or they're going to put me in the hospital. <laughs> yeah. All right. And then certainly you've got to uh, take care of yourself. Every once in a while, I have failed to do that. And it backfires really big time because I'm not good for me and I'm not good for him either. So uh, self-care is really important and to keep yourself <laughs> from going nuts. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Very definitely. Right. And we made a list of possible emotions. I don't think we have to go through all of them, but I think the main thing we wanted to mention is don't feel guilty if, you know, if you're feeling totally frustrated or depression sets in once in a while or whatever it happens to be, because it is kind of a rough road. And um, so there, don't feel guilty. And uh, right about bringing somebody into the house to go out and drive around or go shopping or whatever you're going to do, you know, um, if they, I, Jim was somewhat resistant to having me bring people into the home at first. And I said, you know, we just have to do this. I need to have a break. Um, and there was no guilt about it. I needed to do it. And so he got used to it. And then he started liking the caregivers because they're really good at and um, so it was fine, but don't let that guilt, it's not on our list. And it's probably the worst emotion you can get under the circumstances. All right, then we both kind of like this one. <laughs> that embarrassing moment when you almost uh -oh, run to help an elderly stranger use the toilet paper, public toilet because it's habit, you know. You do, you do create different habits than you ever thought you would have had before. So, you know, channel constructive behavior, both in you and your loved ones. Um, I have told Joan many a times, one of the true blessings I had is that she and I, um, were capable, it says, talk about your feelings to someone other than your loved one. Well, I didn't want to talk to my children about everything that was going on, although they're all adults and they were all responsible and they were there to help very much. However, there are things when you're going through it that you may not want to share with your children. Joan has been a life sent to me because we, we have laughed about different things that we have both had to do and taking care of our loved one. Um, and it was one of the best medicines we had was laughing with each other because I would call Joan and say, you're not gonna believe what's going on in my house now. Or Joan would do the same personal. thing. Yeah, okay, you won't believe what, what's happening now. Um, I say, find a good friend, find somebody who may be in a similar situation that you can sit down and share some of your nonsensical things with. It's important. We went to a um, support group yeah. for a while with Parkinson's, mm -hmm. um, I, and a lot of you know her, Cindy Ralston was the, uh, was the primary organizer at the time, and I think she's still very much involved. Uh, and it, it was definitely help. It was, it was help for, for a while, but then it just kind of didn't do what we needed it. So we kind of left that behind. And as Lindy said, we were just fortunate that <laughs> we found out we both were having the same problems and uh, was able was able to channel it that way um i have to say prayer too you know oh yeah just uh, uh you know my it, hope it goes better <laughs> my experience with the support groups and we tried several of them however when you say channeling constructive behavior the groups that we went to and they were organized through the parkinson foundation um I found all, all that we heard there were negatives. We found you know, people complaining about everything. And I said, mm, we're not doing this. I'm not, we're not going back. We tried. I did try taking Jim, but um, I did not have a good 
And I don't know whether it was just the group we were with or, but it was an organized, um, you know, place to go to talk to other people, but I didn't want to hear all the negatives. And I, I don't think it was good for Jim to hear all the negatives. So. And actually my, my memory slipped. Uh, Cindy does the multiple myeloma support yeah. group, not oh, okay. Matt Parkinson's, okay. so. Mine, brain drain. <laughs> Did you participate in the Parkinson's uh, exercise program at all? Yes. We did, we, we did, we definitely did for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a good one at Lakeview, which was actually yes. free. Um, and so we did, we did that. All of that was really pre-stroke. Yeah. Yeah. After the stroke, it's become all uh, re rehabilitation. Right. Because mm -hmm. he was, he was already progressing to the fact that uh, he didn't like it, but he loves to go out. He wants to go out and eat and see people all the time. And we had reached the point even before the stroke that I was pretty much forcing a wheelchair on him when we went out. For one thing, he scared some of his friends to death when they took him out to, you know, out for dinner or stuff like that because his, his balance was just so bad. <laughs> and uh, so now after the stroke, as I just said, we, we been mainly in rehab and they have him they have him walking with a walker mm -hmm. but it's a perfectly flat surface it's carpeted um, he insisted on walking <laughs> someplace <laughs> the other day and uh, of course ended up <laughs> falling in the process mm -hmm. and uh, so yeah it's a tough balance mm -hmm. you know they they want to do things but sometimes it's just over the over the head and um this reminds me one time joan and pat and jim and i went to starlight theater well both mm -hmm. of the guys were on walkers at that time <laughs> and okay. as we were trying to get to our seats there were so many people that wanted to help us you have to be careful because people naturally want to help you with a loved one that's in a wheelchair or a walker but like we both knew what they were capable of uh, and how to help them. And all of these other people that were kept trying to help us, it was like, no, we're fine. You know, just let us get to our seats. It was interesting. Um, now if something, oh, okay. okay. So if anybody wants to push the wheelchair, that's fine with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, or put the wheelchair in your car. <laughs> <laughs> um, a big thing you need to think about and um, I, I thought about this, if something happens to you, what then? Yeah. And again, I said, I had three families within 10 minutes of me, so I had support, no question about it. But that's not normal for a lot of people who are taking care of loved ones and they don't have that kind of support. So if you're in a car accident, if you get sick, um, if you have medical issues of your own, what do you do? You really need to have an alternative plan to think about what would I do if I had been in a car accident and Jim had been home alone, what would I have done if I didn't have my children to call and say, you need to get over to the house and take care of dad right away. Um, but you might not think in those terms as to you, something may happen to you. Um, and then you have the concern of what's ever happened to you plus What's happening with you, loved ones? All right. If you can't see the <laughs> see it, we have a gentleman in a hospital bed, all wrapped up with cords, and it says, "I'm sorry, dear. I just promised to have and to hold you, not untangle you." <laughs> Where did you get all these cartoons, you guys? Oh. I tell you, um, there are cartoons on anything. Put in, I put in caregiver cartoons. Oh, okay. And it actually came up. <laughs> a bunch of them that I wanted were copywritten, so I couldn't, you know, couldn't collect them. But, uh, oh yeah, I, I thought this subject is so friggin' dry. We got to have something. <laughs> oh, so we ho hopefully we broke it up a little bit. Um, a biggie that really, really changes when you become a, a caregiver 
at any stage mm -hmm. is time. And um, they always need you when <laughs> you're in the bathroom. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Or the shower. Or the shower <laughs> or anything like that. Um, and you have this plan, you know, <laughs> I'm going to get this done today. And then they call you from the bathroom or they need to be in the bathroom. They might fall. They might have a seizure. Uh, time just disappears. It's just crazy. Uh, the fact that I actually got through this PowerPoint was really, <laughs> really rewarding to me. This is like the first, seems like one of the first times I've actually started a project that I ended, you know, finished the project. This, most of the time it's always interrupted. So I had to get some creative in my time, but uh, it did. And we didn't talk about it, um, but it sort of goes on the same line here is that caregivers lack of sleep. You, your time changes drastically, but so does your sleep. Um, I, I mean, you don't get your sleep. You don't get your rest. I was up three and four times a night with Jim. And then you don't go back to sleep right away. Um, <laughs> but you have to be very conscious of, you know, trying to stay healthy and just not trying to stay well to take care of them. Sleep deprivation sets in quickly, <laughs> which some, I don't know about most people, but I think it's might make a lot of people a little grumpy and you don't want to be grumpy around the person. Yeah, so it's, you got to watch your sleep also. All right. Caregiver moment number 12, arguing <laughs> for 30 minutes to give your loved one, get your loved one to wear the same <laughs> matching socks. Then you realize you went out with your own shirt on backwards. <laughs> 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 then we also in our conversations over over doing this uh, also came up with can you provide the care the caregiving uh, as Lindy always emphasized the most important thing is that we try to keep our loved ones safe and uh, then you have to keep yourself safe and healthy. Uh, mm -hmm. I know a lot of the rehab people have turned to me in more than one time and said, if he starts to fall, don't try to stop yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. he's a good sized guy and he would take us both down quite easily. So, you know, they've repeatedly said, if, yeah. if something's going wrong, you've got to get out of the way. Mm -hmm. So this is another factor of you know, if it's not going to work for you, don't feel guilty. Yeah. It's best for it's best for both of you, mm -hmm. your loved one and also yourself. Very definitely. Mm -hmm. So, you want to go back? Okay. So, um, there are a lot of resources available in Johnson County um, and in Kansas City itself. But one of the ones that is really important is I don't know if you can can you see this? Oh, there we go. Okay, it is a book, the 2021 Explore Your Options, a directory of services, and it's from the Area Aging, age, the Area Agency on Aging. And Joan didn't have one, she called and got one sent to her. It's, um, I mean, Lindy, we lost your volume. Oh. How about there that? We go. There Better? you go. There okay. you go. So um, a directory of services for the area aging, area agency on aging. There, you can there, call there. up, I can give you the phone number and you can get one for your home because it goes through all types of services you may need. And um, it's really very thorough and they put it out every year. The phone number on it is 913-715-8861. 913-715-8861. Um, and it's, a, it, it's just filled of all types of resources, including things like home improvement and home maintenance and um, things that you might need help with. Thank <laughs> you.
Wait a minute. Hi, hi Lori. <laughs> I'll go ahead. I'll go ahead and put that oh, on. Now, our, Donna, I'll mm -hmm. put that on our Facebook page for people to. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's a good idea. okay. Oh, it showed me how to unsave, but he didn't show me how to share again. Oh, here it is. Here it is. Right there. Both of you have chosen to keep your husbands at home, your loved ones, mm -hmm. um, and you're relatively young in the scope of things, <laughs> you know. But fast forward ten years. You know, sometimes that's not always the situation, depends, depending on age and health. So mm -hmm. uh, did you run into a lot of people that couldn't do everything that you could do and, and made other choices or? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, I don't think I've really branched out that mm -hmm. much. Uh, um, my oh. six adult kids, which would be three in-law kids, and my two, my my three children. I had one that um, constantly told me, Mary Beth, you can't keep doing this. You can't keep doing this. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, over out of all the six, there is one, and and um, it was always very interesting um, because he they would come over. We had you know we used to have Sunday dinner every other week in my house with everybody. And um, he constantly said I couldn't do it. And my answer always was, until I can't keep him safe in my home any longer, I'm going to keep him here and do whatever I can. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a good friend right now whose husband is okay. just got, yeah. Yeah, um, he has Parkinson's actually. And he was sick, went to the hospital, had to go to rehab, went to rehab. The caregiver, the wife, had a stroke. Oh, dear. Oh, wow. And, um, yeah. So um, they would not send him home to her as they shouldn't. And he ended up going to rehab and then to a facility. And I just recently learned, because of COVID, she hadn't seen him in like five months now because she couldn't go in. Um, they won't let you in. Um, she has put her home on the market and she's moving to, they have assisted care and all types of care units. She's actually moving to where he is so she can see him. Because, um, yeah. So you, Mary Beth, you just don't know what's going to happen. Sure. You know? He was in the hospital when she had a stroke. Mm, and yeah. it was just devastating. And then COVID, not letting her see him for five months. They could talk, talk on the phone, that was it. So, um, you know, I don't know. I think the answer is, do you feel you can keep that person safe? That's the bigger thing of all of it, you know, and manage the medicines and manage the doctor appointments and manage, you know, just getting Jim in and out of a car was not the easiest thing in the world, you know? And I know Joan struggles with the same thing, you know? So, uh, I don't really have an answer to it, but I did have an answer to my one son-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> told me I couldn't do it anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I pretty much question. agree with that. We yeah. have had, um, whether he remembers or not, um, I think what will break it for us is if he gets to the point where he can't transfer because he's a good sized guy and you know, if he can't get from the wheelchair to the chairlift, uh, he's not going to be able to stay at home. And he actually yeah. admitted that to his daughter. It's been quite, it's been a while, whether he still remembers or not, I don't know. But uh, that's one reason, as I say, the rehab has just been absolutely mm -hmm. fabulous. If we hadn't, if he hadn't had that much rehab, I don't think he'd been at home yeah. very long at all. And mm -hmm. if the timing had been different with the stroke, he would have been in assisted living during COVID. Uh, so yeah. we got, I mean, we got all types of lucky, if you want to put it that way, mm -hmm. because we got, I got him in and out. We, he had a stroke in October. Uh, we got him out of respite care December 12th, but you know, if, if that stroke had happened in March, 
We've, yeah. been, we've been talking about what what Lindy's friend's been talking about. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, in weird ways, I know I was blessed <laughs> with, with at least pretty good timing. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, I think that's all we have. <laughs> but, yeah. Well, happy. Excellent job. Have any questions? Thank yes. you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Can I ask? Um, Sure. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, first of all, thank you. That was marvelous. And, and I let's give them yeah. a nice hand. Just wonderful. <laughs> so practical and helpful. Yes, and I know absolutely. it's not easy to talk about uh, such personal matters. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, just one, um, a small question. On outside help, what is reasonable to, do, to expect from outside help? That... Uh, and we've both had experience. The I've had outside help since January of 20. Yeah, right. Yeah. And the the company that we went with, I, we interviewed three. And uh, those of you that know Pat, one of them had been had worked at Kmart. So they bonded immediately because yeah. Pat used to work at Kmart. So quote unquote, the decision was made. So whether it was an intelligent decision, I don't know, but that was the company we went with because of the Kmart stories. Uh, they charge $26 an hour. They will do light housekeeping. So she does at least Oh. two loads of wash every day she's there. Uh, she'll dust. Uh, I've had her clean out, you know, kind of clean the refrigerator a little bit. Didn't, haven't really pushed anything heavy, but they, they are there to also do some, which is a, oh, that's a godsend to a caregiver. You laundry. know, if, if I was doing that much laundry, <laughs> laundry, uh, I'd be crazy too. And so they do do that. Now, I also have contacted a few people independent, not mm -hmm. with an agency. And I kind of mentioned why we've stayed with an agency and they were $25 an hour mm -hmm. yeah. and they weren't gonna necessarily be supervised. And um, one of the caregivers, uh, um, and don't think you're gonna get the perfect caregiver the first time. I'm sure I've been through 25 caregivers. <laughs> um, and all of them, as Lenny said, all of them but one was, was actually good, but circumstances come up, their lives change, it, all, that, mm -hmm. all that type of stuff. Um, but uh, one day their car wouldn't start and he needed to go to therapy. So he was late, but the company sent someone with a car and got him to therapy which isn't gonna happen with an independent. So that's just been my decision at this point. So. I, I had caregiving for the last two years coming in and I chose not to have them do anything in the home. Um, they would have done like, they would have prepared some meals, they would have done some cleaning. They definitely would have done the laundry, which is a big issue, believe it or not. Um, but I chose and the reason why is because Jim was prone to falling, which is why we were in the hospital so many times. Um, and so I just always wanted them just right by him. I didn't want them, you know, in the laundry room or in oh, the kitchen. Good boy. Um, I always wanted them right there with him. So I never gave them any of the extra assignments that they could have, but they gladly would have done them. But I decided it was more important to me to know they were right there next to him in case he decided to get up. <laughs> and go somewhere and do something, you know, um, because they, I really believe, I know Jim and I think Pat too, they believe they can do more than they're capable of doing. Oh, that's why. <laughs> right? That's why he fell walking mm -hmm. out of a retail <laughs> environment. <laughs> yeah. Right. So. so are these caregivers that... Covered by Medicare or the supplemental insurance, or is this not? No, no. nope, <laughs> totally out of pocket. Out of pocket. Yep, at least I haven't found anything. Nope. 
No, yeah, there's no coverage for any of that. Uh, As I say, there is some insurance. I, I don't know why I got so hip on insurance, but I took out some insurance for long-term care and also in-home care. Well, so the in-home care reimbursed me, but just like everything else that's legal, it was little tiny print, there was this max. So I think I basically broke even. So the, the things that I've been paying for, I got paid back later, but I don't think it really saved me any money. So, okay. but, yeah. yeah. Well, um, we didn't put this on here, but I will, I'll, I'll just make one short statement about this. Um, the general philosophy about hospice is that they come into the home when the individual is close to death. I did have hospice in the house um, for about, it might've been a month, might've been longer, might've been six weeks. Um, they provide all the equipment you need. They brought me a hospital bed. They, I mean, everything in the world, any equipment you may need, they will bring you for free. Um, the nurse we had was fabulous. She had such a wonderful rapport with Jim. And um, they, she wasn't there because she felt it was the end of his life. She was there to provide medical supervision um, and care. And so a very good friend of mine is the person who helped build the hospice house for Olathe Medical Center. And I've spoken with her at length about hospice. And she says, there's just such a misnomer out there about that. The nurse I had, Nikki, who was wonderful, actually was caring for a man and she was on her second year of caring for him at no expense. Hospital wow. does not cost you any money. No, no, neither does their equipment. I mean, it doesn't cost you anything, okay? So I would just say that, you, you know, there are times that you may consider talking to, there's something like 47 different hospice agencies in the metro area, okay? Um, but the fact that it didn't cost you anything. Now they never, Nikki never stayed with Jim and I left. That was never something they did. But the other support was really very valuable and it was not just end of life by any means. So when would you decide to bring in hospice care for that type of care versus an in-home caregiver? I did because um, I was at the point um, we were supposed to be going to Florida, the whole family on vacation. And the week before that, Jim had fallen again. And I told the kids, you're going on vacation. Jim and I are staying home. And so the girls all came over to my house to talk to me about, because I rent a house on the beach every year, blah, blah, blah. And so they, I was trying to get the plans with them set so that all three families could go to the beach. And um, my daughter-in-law's mother works for doctors. And I didn't know, I was right at the point because of the fall that I was seriously thinking I couldn't keep him safe anymore. That I was at the point that it was gonna to have to, he was gonna to have to go into a facility. And I was just really very upset. And my daughter-in-law said, well, why don't you, she called her mother and her mother recommended that I call hospice and I didn't know anything about it. And I said, well, okay, I'll call. And I called only to find out what they would provide for me. At that point, I didn't have a hospital bed in the house, but that was coming in. I mean, that came in the same day. Um, mm -hmm. And so they provide services that I felt I could continue to keep him safe at home, um, mm -hmm. rather than having to put him into a facility. So, and it was just a fluke that I even found out about it because I didn't know anything except for the thing, same thing most people know, hospices and life care. Right. It's not. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Any other Thank questions? you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for Thank joining. You too. Thanks for joining us. We hope you learned a little bit. Thanks, guys. Oh, it was great. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank we you. Did. Give Thank us you. a few days if, if you want to look back on any of the things I talked about. We'll have it on our JCCC YouTube. Site. Hey, good idea. Yeah, and I would say if you ever have any questions, did you want to yeah. call me personally or Joan? Pick up the phone and call us. You know, I would be fine with that.